Okay, everyone, so let's get going with the cognitive approach in psychology for 16 marks. Now, this approach <laughs> seems quite scary to students, but actually, if you keep it simple, you keep it very discreet, but you make sure that you are analysing things separately, as I've got here, you can do very, very well with this. Now, it's a very controversial thing because this cognitive model has moved into brand new directions and there's a big AO3 for that, which I'm going to leave until the very end of the video. It's a very high level AO3 and I'm going to leave it until the end. It's about the huge controversy of making neuroscience really the main thing in this approach and it's got really there's a lot of critics of it and there's a lot of pluses too but it's actually very interesting okay so what are the concepts of the model these are the AO1 points here for six marks now when you're talking about concepts of the cognitive model you are going to bring in theoretical computer processing so these two more or less merge as you are discussing them. Okay, the concepts are that this model sees the mind as a computer and it sees it as being all a part of the brain now, whereas it didn't before. It is really an information processing model, an information information processing model and it is really, it used to be aligned with the behavioural, but it's now more or less aligned with the biological model. And that's a big controversy, okay? So this model attempts to look at our behaviour through looking at our thinking, okay? Now, we can't observe anybody's thinking. So the only way to observe anybody's thinking is by asking them or by doing some sort of lab experiments with them, like, you know, you know, some sort of testing on them. And of course, by deciding that you are going to visualize it as a computer processing thing. All right, so, so, you know, therefore it's a very conceptual model. It is very abstract. And therefore, that's going to lead us to some of the real issues with the validity of the model. Okay, so the principles of the model, I'll just say it again. It's an information, it's an information processing model, and it's very theoretical. It's actually based on the idea that our minds, you know, work like a computer, and we can actually visualize it stage by stage. Now, now a very good example that you should all bring in here is the atkinson Schifrin model of memory, which is known, of course, as the multi-store model. That model is a very good example to bring in here as an early example of this approach um, and that's because, if you remember, you don't have to go into loads of detail here. Please don't go off on a tangent and describe the multi-store model in great detail. All you have to say is that the Atkinson Schifrin, don't forget him, the Atkinson and Schifrin modal, as it was originally called, or uh, as we now say, the multi-store model, was a computer programming information model. It described memory as in stages, okay? Do you remember? So you've got the sensory memory going into the, the short-term memory, going into long-term memory. And that was like a, you know, like an information processing on a computer. And don't forget, during the 1960s, computers were very basic, okay? Um, but that was the idea. And of course, yeah, we know it was wrong, and we know it had to be, you know, revise, but that's not the point you're going to make here. Okay, the point you're going to make is very early on when this model began in the 1960s, memory was able to make use of this approach and that created this model of memory. And that's the point you're going to make. Okay, that's a very good A01 point to make. There's no need to criticize the model. You just describe it as being a, you know, computer 
processing approach to memory. Now, of course, you've only done memory um, in your course, and the cognitive model is more than about memory. It might be good just to mention, actually, here when you're beginning this whole 16 marker, that, that, that you know this approach is looking at things like attention, um, perception, which if you go to university to do psychology, you will study all of those marvelous things. However, you know, we've only done memory in our course, all right? So that actually fits in really well with our next point, okay? This model very early on developed the idea of schemas. Now, schemas are very crucial here. Okay, what are they? Well, you all know what they are basically, okay, because you had to do this earlier in the first paper. Okay, they are actually like a package of information in our brain, which can be about anything at all, or in our memory, sorry, which can be about anything at all. Now, babies are born with a very basic, you know, sort of motor schema, you know, for clutching onto things, for opening their mouths and doing all the other things they do. But as we develop, it becomes more and more like a mental process. So like a very good example of a schema would be, here's a good example, if you saw a man running after a bus, what would you immediately think? And I've, I've said that you know, incorrectly. If you saw a man running down the street and, you know, and there's a bus moving off, you know, what would you immediately think? Well, you would immediately think the man is after the bus, right? The man has lost, has missed the bus. But actually, if you then saw a dog running down the street and the bus moved off, you'd think, oh no, actually he's chasing his dog. So you've got a schema of, there's a, you know, there's a person running and there's a bus moving off, they have missed the bus. But that schema would lead to you making an incorrect, you know, like assumption of something, you know, which you have seen and therefore fits in very nicely with a real life application I don't see very often in our textbooks, but you want to link it into an eyewitness account and research. Okay, very, very good there. So schemas are very important for us to make sense of our world. and They've been developed, okay, within this model. Finally, for AA1, don't forget, you've only got to get six marks here. Finally, okay, within this model is this, you know, this idea of scientific evidence for, for the brain mixing in with cognitive neuroscience now. So, you know, before the study of the brain and, you know, neurology was very, very discreet or separate from the cognitive model. But since the last maybe 15 to 20 years, even the last 10 years, it's become hugely merged and there's a big issue with it. But you're just going to discuss here, okay, what it is. So what it is is that we are now mixing up our ideas of the mind as a computer with the actual structure of the brain. So we are now deciding that by using our new techniques of that we didn't have before, okay, such as scans and so on, which we didn't have in the 1960s. So now we can watch a person's brain as they are doing these sort of cognitive tasks. And therefore we can decide that there are areas of the brain which are linked, okay? So e.g. a very good example to give would be episodic and semantic memories, which have been linked with the prefrontal cortex. And also there's a parahippocampal gyrus, which is linked with OCD. These are mostly in your textbooks. So give those examples and explain that it's a new area which is always developing and there is a bit of, you know, controversy over this area that I will discuss at the end. Okay, guys, well, that's it for AO1 points. It's not so bad, is it, actually? It looks pretty horrific, the cognitive model and all sorts of abstract ideas. But actually, if you keep in the keywords, okay, the information processing model, and you go through it the way I have just done now, you can, you know, that's going to get you six marks. Now, for 10 marks for, for this, okay, for AO3 now, now don't forget, I'm doing an open-ended scenario here, like outline and evaluate the, the, um, the cognitive approach or discuss, okay? But if you've got a scenario, then you need to get that sorted first and then go on to this. Okay, so the AO3, what are the plus points here? 
it is scientific, very scientific, and that's a plus because it is testable. Very easy to talk about all the ways in which that has been done. It might be good to bring in the working memory model here. That's a cognitive model. The working memory model has been hugely controversial but highly testable in the lab. Okay, all the models of memory you've done have been really tested in the lab. And it's very easy to do so. It's very easy to control the IV and therefore to measure the DV in a very controlled environment. And that's a plus. That's a plus, okay, because we can replicate and we can get scientific evidence. All right, but, and it might be good to bring it in here. Why wait until the end? Why not bring in this thing here? It lacks ecological validity. Oh, sorry about that bit. It lacks eco valid. In other words, it lacks external validity. Yes, we can do all of our testing in the lab. And of course, we can use scans. Okay, bring those in as well. But what you do in the lab is not your real, if we're going to discuss memory, okay, and you've been bringing in, say, memory as an example of this model. The tests, okay, for memory, for example, you know, are nothing to do with our real life experience of memory. Okay, so when we bring people into the lab, we are completely lacking eco validity, and therefore these theories lack ecological validity. I'll say it again, the theories themselves are not easily applicable to real life if the evidence is only coming from the lab. Okay, so therefore the way our memory actually works in real everyday life may be different. Okay, the way our perception and attention is working because of all the issues with a lab situation. Okay, e.g. demand, e.g. You know, it's not um, the way we do memory, you know, sort of memory testing. It's not, e.g. when we used to do all those, those old experiments that Lizzie, you know, Lizzie Loftus did, for, you know, for eyewitness testimony. Okay, do you remember those with the car at the stoplight and blah, blah, blah. Nobody gave a hoot if there was a barn or not a barn, right? Because it's not real life. It's not in a court of law. You know, nobody's going to go to prison. It's not real everyday life. When we look at real life memory, as you remember from doing the module, it's very, very different. And we get a completely different result. <coughs> okay, so it lacks eco valid, even though it is scientific. What's a plus about neuroscience? Well, the plus about neuroscience is that we are expanding this model in a wonderful way, okay, which is brand new and of course means that it's becoming more and more scientific. So these two go together in a way, all right, and therefore we are, you know, you know, we are by default expanding the biological model into new territory here. And this might have real life application, it hasn't quite happened yet, but it is you know, it does have the potential for real life applications in maybe helping people who have got certain deficits, okay, with their memory or other things like that. But that's a very new cutting edge area, hasn't quite happened yet. All right, so neuroscience, you know, the more scientific we are, the more, we, you know, we can apply it to everyday life in our medicine. That's the point, hopefully. Now, um, here, though, the real life application, and don't forget, I'm going to give you a big minus with the neuroscience. I'm wondering whether I should give it to you now. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's you know go with the minus with the neuroscience. Okay. Before we go into the real life application, the minus with it being a neuroscience is this. Ah, oh, this might take me off in a big diversion, but I think it's going to be worthwhile. Okay because this is really a star material and you may want to know about this. The minus with this neuroscience, guys, is this. Whereas before the cognitive model was looking at the mind in a very abstract way, when we move it in to look at the brain as well, mix it in with the actual structure of the brain, we are deciding, and here's the thing to write down. I hope you're writing down some notes, by the way. <laughs> if you're not, go and grab some paper now and stop the video. It's a very good point. 
we are deciding that the mind and the brain are the same. Whereas the old cognitive model didn't see the mind as being a part of the, of the brain at all. Now, within psychology, there is an area of research looking into, okay, what is our consciousness? What it, it's a very important area of psychology. It's a bit of a sidelined area these days. But again, if you go to university and you really take this into a, you know, a more in-depth level, you'll realize how important it is. We don't understand what is the consciousness in psychology. We don't understand it in science. It's a bit of a mystery. Okay. And the idea is that if we make the mind, the brain the same thing, we are, we are making a jump which may be a mistake, a really big mistake. And we will never truly understand what is our consciousness because to understand the consciousness we need to, and there is evidence of this, and I'm going to give you some from my own life in a minute, there is evidence that, that you know, that the you know, that the mind is not the same as the brain. So that's a big controversy, okay? I'll say it again to make it easy. With the new move into neuroscience of this model, into looking at the link, okay, between our thinking and the brain and trying to merge it and make it all the same thing, we are saying that our minds are the brain. But there's a lot of evidence out there that, that our mind is not, that our mind is not exactly the same as our brain. And we don't understand this. It's very hard to test, but, it, you know, you know, there is evidence. Therefore, many psychologists, I wouldn't say many, I'd say a few, a bit of the borderline psychologists who are looking at the consciousness issue don't like this move at all. They think it's wrong to completely merge, okay, this theoretical computer abstract model with the you know with the actual brain itself okay and they think it's wrong okay because we're going to lose sight of what is our consciousness and we're never going to find out well that's their idea anyway so it's very it has also got a minus point to it and if you want to go very sort of high level um you know, basically, I, I don't mind saying I have evidence in my own life of this. I had a brain trauma recently, and um, even doing this video now with you all, I know that my mind is very clear. My mind was not affected by that, okay, because I had a concussion, and a concussion can have long-lasting effects. And um, there was a there was a very famous. Um, uh, scientist, I've now forgotten his name, who wrote a book when he he had sort of suffered as I have and I am with these long lasting effects of a concussion of a brain trauma, traumatic brain injury. And he said that he began to realize then that his mind was not his brain. It was very obvious. His mind is absolutely clear. My mind is clear. My intelligence is clear. But my brain ain't working well, guys. Right now, I'm, I'm becoming really fatigued and tired, and I've only been talking to you for a minute or two, yeah, but I can feel I'm struggling now to continue, but I'm going to continue because I want you to have these points. But I know now that, that, that you know, my mind is not my brain. My brain struggles. I'm not going to go into all the problems I've got. There are many. But, um, and the book he wrote actually was called The Ghost in the Brain. So you may want to Google that. And it's very good evidence, only real life evidence from people who are, who are actually suffering from these sort of traumatic brain injuries can make it very clear that the mind and the brain are different. But cognitive neuroscience risks us losing out on that. Okay. Real life application then, well, the real life application I would decide to use is from schemas, okay, I would link it in here. There is a plus of a real life application here because eyewitness testimony, eyewitness accounts have used all of our research into schemas so that we now know, remember Lizzie Loftus, so that we now know that eyewitness testimony is very prone to huge mistakes, okay, because we use our schemas and we think we have seen things that we didn't see or we think that we've seen something that was not there or 
whatever it is, okay, we make big mistakes, okay, because of our schemas, and therefore that's got a real life application to help us to have more accurate eyewitness testimony with the, fill in the gap guys, the cognitive interview. The cognitive interview is about the cognitive model. It's a very good real life application. The last minus, and we've already got a few minuses in there, high level, this one is reductionism. You could end with it at the end if you like, but say it right. Don't just say it's reductionist, therefore it's bad. Just say the problem with the reductionism is, and it is more and more, you know, reductionist now, is that it is actually linking things in with the brain now. So that's made it more and more reduced to one cause of our behavior. It's become linked with the biological model, okay? It wasn't so reductionist before, but as it goes, you know, you know, sort of merging with this neuroscience, it's more and more reductionist. So go back and have a look at the reductionism, holism video that I did. Use all the AO3 points there on reductionism. I don't need to state them here and bring them in. That is why reductionism is a problem. We are losing the whole picture. And in this case, in this case, seriously so, we are losing sight of what our minds are as opposed to our thinking and our intelligence and our brains. It almost sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Well, it is. But um, anyway, there it is. 16 marks easily got. And I hope you do well in the exams coming up. Okay, goodbye for now.